Invito Sua Eccellenza Monsignor Thomas Menan Parampil a presentarci la sua lezione magistrale. My dear friends, I'm uncertain of myself because I have a low voice and I have a long paper. And after speaking after Professor Anderson, I am surely going to lose. Uh, but I'm told this paper will be given to you afterwards. So I just go ahead a little bit along the paper that I, I am attempting to press in and you'll read the rest afterwards. And I find so much of my writing had been summarized there, I'm amazed. I myself had forgotten some of the writings of some years ago and it had been summarized so well and put into relationship, I am edified. So whispering the gospel is not lost energy. Whispering also does work because I see that it has been uh, so well integrated and harmonized. It's my first duty to thank Cardinal Filoni, Rector Magnificus, the Academic Senate of the University of Urbaniana, and the Council of the Faculty of Missiology for deciding to confer upon me a degree honoris causa along with the most respected Dr. Gerald Anderson of the United States. To tell you the truth, I was greatly surprised when I was informed of this decision in favor of an, an unknown missionary in an unknown corner of India. But I accept this honor in the name of all those other valiant missionaries who better deserve it both in my own region of Northeast India and in other parts of the world. I feel an intimate relationship with all those who are passionately convinced that the greatest service to humanity is to share the good news of Jesus Christ with everyone in the measure and in the manner he requires and the, the Lord makes it possible. And as a missionary, as a missionary enthusiasm is growing, feebler in Christian believers. Those who carry this conviction have a greater, greater responsibility to affirm with Paul, I am not embarrassed about the good news of Jesus Christ. It is God's power to save. I am happy to say this before all of you who live in Rome. I am quoting Romans chapter 1, 15. I have an obligation to all. I have chosen the theme, I have an obligation to all peoples, reaffirming our common obligation to reach out with this message of the gospel as Pope Francis has been trying to do with a loving heart and an encouraging word. To ardent believers and those struggling for their faith. To half believers and those who have developed a distance from the believing community without quitting it altogether. Those who feel in their hearts, this is a hard saying, John uh, 6, uh, 60, with, uh, with regard to some of the evangelical demands about the family life. And others who feel, to whom shall I go? You have the words of eternal life. Those who, to those who exclaim like Peter, depart from me, Lord, meaning exactly the opposite, because their sin weighs very heavily upon them. And even to those who persecute the Christian believers, who cast stones at the Christian society, its leaders, its convictions, its proposals, because they have formed soft targets in the present atmosphere of the world. And most of all, as a missionary, in the missionary context, to every individual and every ethnic group, every community, every ethnic group that has not known Christ of whatever disposition and whatever <coughs> position, we have an obligation to all of them. <coughs> when God seems to be absent today in public spaces, we need to remember Jesus' words, a little while and you will see me no more. And again, a little while and you will see me. Because I'll send you the Holy Spirit and he will prove to the people of the world they are wrong about what is right. And he will lead you to all truth. And to all truth, which means when truth also challenges us and even humiliates us, he must, we must accept the truth in its fullness. 
The present crisis that uh, religion is going through is an occasion to deepen our understanding of religion itself. Dukin altum, delve into the deep. Are you busy with the core values of religion? The Lord is asking us, maybe, or with peripherals of religion, vested interests. People of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. I will not go into that section because uh, it's uh, long, but we have an obligation to every tribe and, and tongue and people and nation. I will not rest till everyone knows about Christ. It was the message of uh, Mission Sunday. This is what St. Patrick and Boniface and Xavier, Father Levens, and others believed. I'm so greatly inspired to learn from Professor Gerald Anderson that John Wesley considered the, the whole world his parish. In other words, he, he too felt the same obligation to all peoples. And this is a sense that we need to recapture. And this is a mission of Urbaniana University itself, I believe. And to that extent, I respect it immensely. The fifth point I want to make is respect the selfhood of a community. I know I'm not able to explain it in few words just now. What I would like to emphasize, especially at this brief time, is we have an approach to any community through its culture. Culture can be a hindrance to us if we are not prepared, an ally if we are prepared. And it was always in the missionary tradition. Vatican Council has em emphasized it even more. But very often we look at culture as things, communities as objects. I would like to emphasize, uh, invite you today to remember that we are dealing with people and give a little more attention to the collective personality of a particular community, what I call the selfhood of a society. My earnest uh, plea is respect that selfhood, no matter how small, how insignificant, how backward you think they are, respect that selfhood. That makes tremendous difference. If a community perceives that its collective personality, its inner identity, its selfhood is threatened, it goes on the defensive. It is very difficult to draw it forth again from that position. But if the community feels its selfhood, selfhood is affirmed, that it may further be enhanced with its association with the missionary, a door opens gradually. And an unspoken dialogue, unspoken dialogue believe, begins. We give too much importance to spoken dialogue, and unspoken dialogue also is important. If a missionary has the skill of getting closer to the thinking element in every society, the, that uh, group of people, writers, thinkers, who give a self-identity and a self-pride to that community, the, I call them thinking element. If you are very, very close to them, those who provide a pride, a self-pride and a dynamism in the community and visualize its future, if we are close to them, through them, we communicate so much of the gospel beyond what we ordinarily think. I do not have time to explain it further, but maybe in the paper. There is something like other-centered communication. We go confident about our message, and we are so concentrating on our message, we forget about the other person. Jesus looked at the other person and his problem, and his anxiety, his worry, his agony. So. Can, as we have a child-centered education, people-centered development, can we have uh, other-centered pastoral service, other-centered evangelization? There is a pedagogy in passing on the faith beyond one's own culture, and we often forget about this pedagogy. If evangelization makes the other community's uh, concerns, needs, interests, priorities his own, using concepts, categories, and images from the cultural world of the other person, other community, beginning with the premises they would concede, quoting authorities from their historical and cultural heritage, adopting codes of conduct and eth ethical principles that they understand and respect, then we win their attention, we win their affection. And we come on the wavelength of people. The sensitivity to the community's aspirations is absolutely important. It may be right, it may be exaggerated, but sensitivity and attention to the uh, aspirations of a community, uh, when it is ex expressed by young people, it will be exaggerated, but we should, they should know that we have sympathy. And once uh, the relationship is established, things can go very fast. 
uh, the process may surprise us. Once there is an intimacy with the community, the, the Lord takes over, the Holy Spirit surprises us with uh, uh, amazing things that happen in the mission field. I would give a little importance to negative memories and the mission to reduce anger in societies. One evident obstacle to this effort that we are speaking about is, would be to remove prejudices, memories of historic injuries, perceived vested interests, even of the church or those who are related with the church. Uh, historically, we have hurt each other as ethnic groups, nations, civilizations. It is a part of evangelical work to heal the memories of wounds at the ethnic, cultural, national, and civilizational level. It's not easy. Mahatma Gandhi also said that he tried, but he failed, he said. He tried to some extent, he succeeded to some extent. But many of us together, when we try, memories can be healed. There can at least make some progress. And having worked in the area of reconciliation between communities in, in conflict about two decades, I know the meaning of collective anger. Not the individual anger, but collective anger. Can we become like the lambs of God who take away the anger of the world? At least reduce that bit, a bit of that anger. While we say peace to men of goodwill, can we generate that goodwill in our neighborhood, in our, where we have a minimum of, of influence? As we said, when many of us do uh, make an effort, we succeed to some extent. One more point, which you may not be expecting, do not invite persecution. Do not invite, provoke anger or invite persecution through our own indiscretion. If you are persecuted because of our own imprudences, personal or institutional arrogance, lack of cultural insertion, very important, lack of cultural insertion or human sensitivity, over acquisitiveness or possessiveness, absence of sobriety and balance in justice struggles, a provocative statement, a provocative manner of sharing the faith, then we cannot consider ourselves heroes and heroines and martyrs if we suffer. This point I would like to make in, from experience. I do not want to make a theory out of it from experience. Those who respected the selfhood of communities find it much easier to help in times of tension, of difficulty, of persecution as well. And uh, uh, another dimension of our mission today is defend the vanishing values, vanishing values in present world, is world society. In an increasing con increasingly consumeristic world, what we notice today is a steady erosion of cultures local cultures, community cultures, gospel culture as well, and Christian society's culture as well, the erosion of cultures and values. Consequently, it has emerged as a core missionary concern to de defend the cultural heritages of society along with values that we ourselves stand. And speaking about values, let me also give an emphasis. Inculturation is not about copying some decorative dimension of the culture, but the promotion of core values of a community preserved in its culture through the stimulus of the gospel. I'm defining maybe inculturation is a little different way than some might expect, but that's what I, I am defining. Dialogue two, dialogue two must, uh, especially a dialogue with the thinking element in society should seek to clarify the concepts and strengthen the values of permanent significance. Again, Dialogue should have something to do with the values that are rooted in that culture, are of great value for, the, for times to come. And then you find the response. People appreciate what you're going to say. I am coming out to help to you to preserve your own value. With the help of the gospel, they are not looking just at the gospel alone, but they're looking at their value. They find it stimulated. Miracles happen. Have we been heavy upon our own communities? In this context of secularization, we emphasize preaching and preaching, and it's very extremely good, but could be also emphasized. Finally, there is the reality of those who are keeping a distance from our church. Some keep away because of our own failures. The legalistic, stereotyped, cold, and impersonal dealings of the clergy, often over-demanding of financial contribution. We can work on this. 
Some keep away due to their own suppressed guilt feeling. Can we do something removing the healing of memories, healing of psychological conditionings as well? Half the work of reconciliation is accomplished when people see the missionary having a sympathetic understanding of the supreme effort that they themselves are making in order to be good. So many people are trying to be good, but they're not succeeding, and they're keeping a distance. When, but they see the missionary sympathetic to his effort, as Pope Francis seems to be doing in an amazing way. They come closer. As long as the more challenging dimensions of the gospel are seen as arbitrary clerical impositions, it's, they are hard of acceptance. But if they can be presented as evangelical demands essential for personal and community growth, the acceptance becomes much easier. Uh, because even in the secular society, we know great achievers always made high demands of themselves and of others, and so also in the spiritual field. The 11th point I make is longing for true spirituality in a period when people are, uh, there is a faith fatigue. I will not go into it because we have reflected during the last synod also on this point. There is, we are teaching the same thing, monotonous voice, boredom about the Christian teaching, over familiarity about the same vocabulary, the same monotonous way of expressing. And yet, people go when there is something spiritually stimulating. They go to Teze. They go to Lourdes. They go to Velankani. Why? Because there is a natural hunger for the spiritual in this context. Repentance for the misuse of religion. In historical, historically, if, the, uh, if religion was used for worldly ends, oneself or collective, a particular community, uh, the collective conscience uh, uh, has been hurt. Wars and aggressive impositions of any kind in the name of religion can only invite marginalization of religion in the long term. The harshness of one Christian community on uh, another, uh, cheer, another community in, in our common history, descend, uh, hard, uh, harshness upon dissenters and aliens in the past, wars waged in the name of religion or Christian sounding principles, these leave behind memories that have to be healed. Yeah. And uh, in these periods of uh, secularization and mutual accusation, theological reflection should be helpful, reassuring, stabilizing rather than disorienting. And that is why maybe a university can be of great help. At this stage, I'm going a little faster, uh, I would like to ask whether we do not have a mission of lamentation, not only of preaching, just lamentation, in certain circumstances, I am referring to millions of children, especially girl children in Asia, whose life is terminated in the womb in, in our own days. Millions. Rachel is crying for her children. She refuses to be comforted, for they are dead. My cousin, uh, if we, do not, we, do not, we cannot do much in this matter, we can at least weep. Micah, uh, Micah said... I will weep and lament and powerfully display my sorrow. Lamentation, too, has a message. Now, I'll go a little faster. When in the mission field, you must uh, adapt yourself to the different psychology of different communities. And in the modern particular condition with very great specialization, various uh, disciplines, we need to adapt each discipline according to, the, to each uh, the, the vocabulary of each discipline for which we uh, depend on the peer influence. Can uh, lay persons themselves evangelize people in similar life situations and similar disciplines? So with the family. Be close to the average believer, which Pope Francis seems to be doing in an amazing way. Keep learning. Avoid exaggerations. A very good idea when you exaggerate in this direction about inculturation, about... Uh, evangelization, zeal, or about dialogue. When you exaggerate, you fall into difficulty. Is there something like moderation? I would say the, the Asian sense, Asian sense is a little bit about keep the middle path. Buddha, Buddha said, uh, keep the middle path. So we can avoid a, a lot of mistakes if you avoid exaggeration. I'm making that point there. I'm moving to the end. We are happy that Christ is preached in every possible way. I will not develop this. 
We worked and toiled day and night. In my complete paper, I have some 20 quotations from St. Paul when he said, I worked, I worked day, I worked night, I toiled. And also in Jesus, he says, I am working continuously. My father is working. Well, that's what a missionary's life is. His spirituality is all about pastoral work, commitment, tiredness. But he continues to go to the villages, to the homes, to organize programs, retreats, and so on. Today's difficulty that religions are experiencing is an invitation to depth of different churches to different religions. My own perception is when we reach certain depth, you will find certain bridges emerging by themselves. We can dialogue more meaningfully, and it is in that moment that Christ will emerge what he really is in the history of humanity. Depths mean not just uh, academic depth or um, um, or what do you call intellectual depth, but authenticity, detachment, generosity, commitment. Readiness to share not only good news, but my own very life, St. Paul spoke about it. A missionary who not only gives the message, but he shares life intimately with the people, he convinces to a great extent, and conversions do take place. A word that is not popular in India when you say conversion, but conversion to God, everyone says, that is what evangelization is about, conversion to God. Uh, so uh, readiness to share not only good news, but also our very lives. Last point I make is a mission of compassion. Pope Francis shows us the way. When we say, zealous domus tuve comedit me, may we also remember the Lord is full of mercy and of compassion. And he is very fond of the one who is most distant from him. And uh, the Pope is emphasizing it so beautifully. He is a true missionary. I would just say he, he comes from northeast of India, um, the missionaries of our region, as it were, the way he speaks. And it makes tremendous appeal to us as well. The last point I would like to do is to, can a missionary be with Jesus in his agony in the garden? Human agony in its ugliness of reality, sin, also painful realities that we are making to be painful, pain that we are creating for each other. Jesus took the pain of the world upon himself. We cannot do individually. Maybe collectively we have a responsibility to share this burden that Jesus took upon himself in that agony. And it is from here in this context that we re regain the strength to bring joy to all people. Luke 2.10, when he say uh, that we uh, derive the, that strength required to bring joy to all people, even to people who are far away. Acts of the Apostles 2.35 says, which includes also people in various missions. Maybe in this short time, I spoke in a very confused manner, but the paper will be with you, and somebody will read it tomorrow and find something interesting there. Thank you very much for your attention.